So thank you for sharing that, Robert. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, just for to recap this week, uh, I did send this out to the email list. Uh, I actually sent a slide deck to the University of the Potomac uh, on partnering with CS Sensei. Um, they approached me, Dr. Perry approached me, and uh, made the offer of affiliation. So uh, this will uh, help uh, University of the Potomac to be able to recommend this program in all of their cybersecurity and IT uh, classes. Um, and also it will help us to have a little bit of legitimacy. There you go. Uh, have a little bit of legitimacy when we say the CS Sensei program in association with University of the Potomac. So mm -hmm. um, I sent a slide deck out to the CS Sensei uh, email list. Main reason I did that is that um, Facebook doesn't particularly like PDF attachments. Okay. So I, I put it over on the email list. If you want a copy, just let me know and I'll, I'll send it straight to you. But uh, I, I basically said, you know, here are the advantages of formal education. Here are the advantages of a mentorship type program. Um, I pointed out that they are not mutually exclusive and in fact are entirely complementary. Um, one is formal, the other is informal. One talks about specific measurable achievements. The other one talks about the mindset you need to be successful in the, in the career field. So, okay. you know, they are not at all exclusive. So okay. anyway, uh, here's a little bit about me and Chris. Um, Chris, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to have him on the team. Um, and, and I hope I got this right, Chris. You're one of the first 50 graduates of the OPM's Cyber Reskilling Academy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, okay, good. And you are still teaching Security Plus up at Howard Community College, right? Uh, not anymore. I just did it for one summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you work. But I work. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. Like I say on a resume, if you've done it once, you've done it. Done it. it. Yep. Done it. <laughs> so, all right, and you know that gets you in the door to the interview. Then you can talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. So uh, this was uh, that, it was fun putting that deck together. Uh, uh, Robert, just you know, Dr. Perry and I go back years. Uh, okay. Probably about 12, 14 years, uh, oh, we've yeah. we've attended the same church, and um, he is also, along with being the uh, program chair at University of Potomac, he's the chief of staff and the chief operating officer of the church I used to belong to until I moved down here to Arizona. Uh, so oh, you're in Arizona, okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm in the so yeah, Texas it's in Maryland. Okay, it is six. 09 a.m. here. Wow. And it's 909 there. Yeah. 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 So you think it's early for you, ha? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm usually up every morning anyway at six, but yeah, I I, I commend you. you. You're on a Saturday. You're up. So. Yeah, I I uh, I'm an early riser. <clears throat> what can I say? Yep. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, so I wanted to uh, talk about. This uh, CISA alert that arrived, <clears throat> sorry, it was dated 11 days ago. Mm -hmm. If you are not familiar with CISA.gov, CISA.gov, uh, Robert, I do recommend you go out and take a look at it. It is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of the U.S. federal government. Okay. It's actually under the Department of Homeland Security. Okay. And it is acknowledged to be the number one cybersecurity agency in the federal government. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are a uh, highly uh, viewed uh, site with lots of helpful information, some of it written in very um, uh, readable terms rather than being, you know, technical gobbledygook. It's in terms that normal humans can understand. So CISA.gov is a great place to go. Uh, there is, when you do go to CISA.gov, up in the upper right-hand corner, it, it actually says 
uh, do you want to subscribe to alerts? And you can put your email address in there, and things like this alert will be sent directly to your mailbox. So, so it, CISA.gov? Yep, CISA.gov. Got it, got it. Okay, so this alert came out uh, in, within the last two weeks, and I thought it talked um, thoroughly and yet lightly enough on pretty much everything you should know when you go into a job interview. Okay, I mean, this, if you don't know this stuff, then you have just uh, been schooled in the classroom. Let okay. me put it that way. Okay. You know, you haven't learned by having somebody hack your systems. You haven't been around when, you know, people are um, uh, closing the business because they've been compromised or subject to um, uh, malware or, you know, those sorts of things, cyber attacks, etc. Do you remember the, uh, the pipeline uh, issue that occurred a, a number of months back? In yeah, I remember to hearing something about it. Yeah, that and was. And I also um, recently heard something about the. This was a really interest to me. Was um, Truist Bank account holders got breached in some kind of way, and mm -hmm. I and I am a a Truist Bank account holder. Ah. So, okay. But I mean, well, I'm not a business owner. The, the Truist uh, Truist Bank account holder business business owners had were really were hit recently. Right. Um, so I'm sure you probably heard something about that. So, but I still was just like a little concerned. I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh boy." With the uh, with data breaches like that, the very first thing you should do whenever you hear that you are or may have been involved in a data breach, first thing you should do is change all your passwords. Right. First thing, because, okay. um, <clears throat> and of course they will tell you what data has or may have been exfiltrated, in other words, taken out of their environment. Um, but would you, you know, if, if that's where you bank and that's where your family finances are, <clears throat> you got to ask yourself, do you trust them 100%? Nah, maybe not. Let me, let me go that extra mile and change all my passwords. Mm -hmm. And that way, even if it was exfiltrated, they now have my old password, which I'm not using anymore. You know, yeah, I'm that's, gonna, I'm gonna that's that one of the... As soon as we're finished here. Right. Well, we're going to learn a little bit more about things that you can do, um, even more than that, even greater than that. So okay. uh, that it's good for us to, to look, look at that. So okay. this was the uh, summary text at the beginning of the alert, and I'm going to read it. Uh, just to, so everybody understands, cyber actors routinely exploit, get that word routinely, in other words, this happens frequently, exploit poor security configurations, either misconfigured or left unsecured. That's us, if we're service providers. Weak controls and other poor cyber hygiene practices to gain initial access or as part of other tactics to compromise a victim's system. Mm -hmm. This Joint Sec Cybersecurity Advisory identifies commonly exploited controls and practices and includes best practices to mitigate the issues. Do you know what mitigation means? Um, a little. Like okay. to, to argue or to not argue, but... Um, Here, here's a good way of thinking about it. To mitigate means to reduce the severity or the okay. likelihood. Okay. In other words, if um, uh, 500 accounts got um, compromised and you're able to change the uh, default password on 490 of them, you have now mitigated that 500 down to 10. Okay. Okay. The, the mitigation means to make it smaller. Okay, decrease. All right. Okay. okay, so it talks about best practices that we can employ or we can recommend or we can be part of that help to mitigate the issues. Now, when we talk about this, it's important to understand sometimes we're talking about massive infrastructures like a bank 
um, or a federal government agency. You know, the agency that I belong to has over 500 locations nationwide where people from my uh, department sit and work. So it's usually very massive, but take that massiveness and bring it down to the local scale and think about it in reference to, let's say, you and your family, your local uh, Wi-Fi network, your, uh, like you were saying, your online banking accounts, your retirement accounts, you know, those sorts of things. So everything that we're looking at here may sound big, but you can bring it down to the little and work to employ some of these things right now where you're at to help you be safer. All right. So number one, if you walk into a job interview, they are going to expect that you know all of these things already. Right. So, you know, and they might say, well, what have you done, you know, where you used to work? And you say, well, I'm, I work for the school district, but here's what I've done for my family and my accounts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that you can say in areas where I did have responsibility, I did take this information and did something with it. Right. You know, okay, so um, we're going to talk about uh, four things in this slide deck. And again, if you take a look at the name of the alert across the top, I, I will send this to you or I will put it on the last slide. But um, this alert, I broke it down as small as I could make it, and it's still like 30 slides. So just be aware that um, it's well worth the read and not just once. Okay. All right. So this is, I boiled it down, but I'm going to recommend at the end that you go out and read it yourself because it deals about certain things in greater detail than I have on these slides. Okay. So we're going to talk about commonly used techniques. Commonly, that means they're already occurring to gain initial access to victim networks. That's you. Weak security controls, poor configurations, and poor security practices that are frequently exploited. Things people could do, but they don't bother to. Uh, mitigations to help strengthen your network defenses, things you can do to reduce the likelihood that it'll occur or the impact if it does occur. And then a series of best practices right at the end. If you don't learn anything from this slide deck, learn those best practices. Okay? So first thing, commonly used techniques to gain initial access to victim networks. Um, and I may make this kind of fast, okay. but you can play this back. I record this and put it up on YouTube. All right? Malicious actors commonly use the following techniques to gain initial access to victim networks. Number one, they exploit public-facing applications. Do you know what it means by that? Okay, public-facing means available to the internet. Okay. All right, so that could be cloud services like Microsoft or Amazon. Um, it could be um, services such as Google. Uh, it could also mean public-facing services of your school district or your agency or your whatever, anything that you can get to without like a secure tunnel, like a VPN, public facing means that the folks out on the internet can say, hey, let's see if I can go crash DOD.mil. That's well, public facing. Okay. All right. Another one, external remote services. I, I spoke about it slightly, but things like VPNs. Remote services that are available externally. I can sit here at my home and using my government laptop, I can connect into a government network, but I'm using my home Wi-Fi. So it's an external service that I can use to remotely access internal services within my federal government department. Mm -hmm. Okay, external remote services. Phishing. Phishing, what's the component of phishing you always have to think about compared to these others that I covered? What's the main difference in phishing? Chris? 
Phishing, okay, I'll, I'll tell you. Phishing is not a technical issue. It's a human yes, error sure. issue. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, if somehow they get a hold of your gal, and they do, they send emails to everybody in the gal saying, hi, we're from IT. Please click the following link because there's been security issues and you can reset your password. Guess what? They click the link. They're compromised. So, Chris. Gal's global address list. If, uh, Correct. If anybody doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Global mm -hmm. address list. Um, typically, that's what um, Microsoft calls their big address list. And to give you an idea, um, I was I used to be over with the group that managed the Pentagon global address list. And at the time I was there, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, that was over 120,000 addresses. Oh. One list, one great big monstrous database that if somebody gets a hold of it, they now have 120,000 addresses that they can send email to, like phishing emails. Okay, next one, trusted relationship. Trusted relationship. Can anybody think of an example for this one? For when I say trusted would relationship. That, would that be like, um, say like with Facebook maybe? Keep going. Uh, someone that you know or have a relationship with sends you something that says, hey, you think you know this person, but it's not really them. Okay. Right. Um, uh, you, you're close. That, that is, that's not what relationship means here. The relationship means technical trust. Okay. In other words, have you ever been like over on LinkedIn or on, oh gosh, I don't know, Twitter or whatever, and it says, do you want to log in using your Facebook credentials? Yes, or your yes. Google, Google account. Yeah, like well, log in with Google or Gmail. And what happens then is this provider takes the, you say, I, you know, I want to log in with my credentials, and the provider goes over to that original provider and says, here are the credentials. Do you approve them? And Google or Amazon or whatever comes back and goes, yep, they're good. The trust is between these two providers, not between you and somebody else. It's right. between the two providers. So if you ever see that thing that says you want to log in using Google, that can be exploited. So that's what it's referring to. I've, I've done that before. Mm -hmm. Not a try, lot. Try and I remember this. In nature, I'm, I'm very, always leery of so many things like that. And Good. a lot of times, even I've received text messages all the time. I just I don't even click on them. But I've I've had a situation like that where you would have logged on through this and I've done it before, but not a lot, but I've actually I have done it before. Right. Yeah. Um I, I sent this out to the uh uh to the Facebook page. I got this one about a week or two ago. It says, Hey your chase card needs attention. Click mm. on this. Or wow. call the, the number. Well, that number is a valid number for Chase. But um, it says click, you know, chase.com. You click on that, guess where it takes you? It doesn't take you to chase.com. Mm. I went to Chase and verified this, handed this to them and said, is this valid? She said, do, 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 let's call the number. Yeah, that sounds like us. And then she, she looked up here at the source number and said, mm. that's not a Chase number. Wow. So from the, from the lady at the, you know, right there at the desk, the receptionist, she said, I don't recommend you click on that. If somebody ever sends you something like that, turn your card over and dial the toll-free number on the back of the card. Right. And say, hey, I just got a text. Is there something wrong? What you've done is you're not responding to the text. You're going straight to your provider. Right. Yeah. I've, I've okay. actually... I've done that before as well. I was Larry. I can't remember. Um, it might have been. I don't think it was my bank, but it might have. It was an account that I had, and I wasn't. I wasn't. I was Larry about it. So I just. I used my card. I flipped. I used the number that I've always used to call the institution 
to verify. They was like, nope, that's not us. We wouldn't ask you to do so-and-so. I said, well, thank you. Yep. And that was it. Very good. Uh, it, it pays to be um, uh, not so trusting. I'll just say it that way. Absolutely, yeah. So um, let's go to the next one. Commonly used techniques to gain access. Valid accounts. Do you know what that means? Valid accounts. Like, my, like well, accounts that I really have? Correct. Um, number one, it could be like from a data breach. Mm -hmm. But another thing that could be used is an account with poor passwords. Now, now, let me ask you this. What do you recommend that you store your passwords on? Because Oh, like a password you, manager? You guys both know we have so many things that have so many passwords. Mm -hmm. I have an app that I keep them in. Mm -hmm. which like is very OnePass or Keeper? Yeah, I have a, a yep. secured app, so I think that I, that I keep all my passwords in. Mm -hmm. But is that something you, because I know there's so many, you have so many passwords, you can't remember all of them. Right. It's not a bad idea to use something like Keeper or OnePass. Um, uh, recognizing that at least one of those has, has themselves been compromised. So it just, it behooves you to stay smart on all of this, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, any, any measure that you take is a measure in the right direction. Okay. That's what I use right now. I just, I have an app that I store all my passwords on and yep. whenever I need it, you know, get it. Okay. It's called LastPass. I don't know. LastPass. Okay. Yeah. I've heard of LastPass, OnePass, Keeper. Uh, there are, half a dozen of them out there um, and and they're all usually pretty helpful but again you need to keep track and find out when and if they themselves end up getting compromised okay because that does happen so yeah okay the next one other things these are weak security controls poor configurations and poor security practices that are frequently exploited okay there's a bunch of them so be prepared malicious cyber actors often exploit the following common weak security controls poor configurations i've got oh i'm gonna yeah okay i just muted harminder um Poor security practices to employ initial access techniques. Number one, multi-factor authentication is not enforced. MFA is available on nearly everything now. For your Google, for your Yahoo, for your Hotmail, for your Outlook, for your Amazon, for your LinkedIn, for your Facebook, Multi-factor authentication is available, and most of us don't use it. That is number one, the number one thing that you can do to help make things better for you is to employ what's already available. Uh, I'm going to try and find it. Here it is. I use, uh, just so you see it down here, it's a Google Authenticator. All right. Um, on some of these, uh, well, in fact, I use Google Authenticator, but not for Google. What can I say? Um, with the Google accounts, whenever I try and log in, my phone pops up and says, was that you? And I click on, yes, that was me, and then it lets me in. That's two-factor, okay? Uh, but Google Authenticator, I have, let's see, Oh, I do have some Google stuff in there. Google, Amazon, login.gov. I use the Google Authenticator for login.gov. Why not? Because you can use multiple different authenticators. Just use one that you're comfortable with. Microsoft has one free. Google has one free. Those are the two biggest. Um, and also, um, Defense Acquisition University, DAU. Um, I have... Uh, with my Google Authenticator. Use multi-factor authentication. The easiest one is where it sends you an SMS text and says, is that you? Trying to log in from 
X, Y, Z. Now that's something I will now uh, impl implement because I noticed that some um, things that I log on to ask me, do you want to set up do a mobile? Do you want to? And yep. I usually don't. There you go. So now I will. Mm -hmm. There you go. So multi-factor authentication is not enforced. It's available, but people say, nah, I'll do that later. Or nah, it's too much of a worry. Or nah, I don't even know what that is. I so knew what it was. I just I was like I was one of those, ah, I'll do it later. Yep. 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 Well guess what? Later has come. <laughs> So another one, um, incorrectly applied privileges or permissions and errors within access control lists. Access control lists is a fancy way of saying what accounts are given what level of access to what systems and services within your infrastructure. For example, within Microsoft, there are domain admins and they have access to various services and security at the domain level. Above that is what's called the schema admin and they have access to schema stuff but domain admins can't access schema level services. That's and somehow or another let's say somebody's working somewhere and they were a domain admin but now they moved somewhere where they're not a domain admin but they forget to remove their privileges. So now they're over here not doing domain admin work but still possessing domain admin privileges. That's incorrectly applied privileges. Okay? Um, software is not up to date. Big deal. It says, do you want to update? Do you want to apply your patches? No, I'll do it later. Guess what? Later is time. Software is not up to date. This also applies to operating systems. If you're running um, uh, uh, Windows 10, Windows 11, uh, Apple OS, iOS, they all allow you to turn on what's called automatic updates. A good thing to do, but there may be uh, reasons why those automatic updates don't get applied. I'll give you a great example um, with like uh, iOS devices they have to be uh, at least 50% charge on it and on local Wi-Fi. They won't update over the internet. So you got to make sure that's why you plug your phone in at night. So it gets on the local uh, Wi-Fi and the charge goes above 50% so that it can apply those updates. So just something to be aware of. Next one, use of, we talked about this last week, Chris, vendor supplied default configurations or default login usernames and passwords. Um, if you go onto the Facebook and our Facebook page and take a look, we actually, uh, I went out to a website, I went out to Google and I said, show me um, default logins and passwords. Pow, there it was for Asus devices, this is the default login and password. For 3Com devices, this is, you know, for Cisco, for Microsoft, for Amazon, for and it just went right down the line and said, here's the default login and password for those devices or services. What? TP-Link, your home Wi-Fi routers, guess what? They have a default login and password. So, if you leave those vendor supplied default configurations, your default passwords could be published on the internet. So change them. Make them different. Make them yours. Um, here's another one. Uh, remote services like VPNs, we talked about this, but the VPNs themselves lack sufficient controls to prevent unauthorized access. Um, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a short discussion here, but um, within our VPNs that we used to have, they have what was called level three certification and level four certification for the networks. One type of um, 
VPN we used was level three certified and the other was level four certified. The federal government specified you can't use level three certified networks anymore. You have to stop using that VPN because it's level three certified and not level four. Guess what? We all had to stop using that VPN. And, you know, it had to do with somewhere within the initial handshake, the credentials were passed in clear text, which made it level three, but not level four. So we had to get rid of it. So here they're talking about it. VPNs lack sufficient controls to prevent unauthorized access. Next one. Strong password policies are not implemented. What it means by that is, um, uh, uh, I'll give my example. I used to bank at a certain bank, and they said, okay, do you want to change your password? I said, sure. And they said, put in your password. And I put in the password that I wanted, and they said, oh, no, that's too complex. You have to have uppercase, lowercase, numeric, but you can't use special characters. And my response to that was, buy, and I went and banked somewhere else. Because they literally would not allow me to put in a complex enough password to make me feel comfortable. Their strong password policies were not implemented. They probably are now, but they lost my banking business. Um, another one, cloud services are unprotected. Remember we talked about handshakes and how certain things need to make sure that they are not passed in clear text. Cloud services are notorious for uh, passing certain things in clear text in order to establish the encrypted tunnel. Well, that's fine once the encrypted tunnel is there, but if you're starting and you pass the credentials, it's not secure. You just passed information on how to get into that encrypted tunnel. So cloud services are always a concern. You always have to make sure that your security is scanned and implemented for cloud services like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, etc. Okay, next one. Open ports and misconfigured services are exposed to the Internet. Let's say you have a workstation. No, I'll get even better. You have a server, and you put it out in your DMZ so that it now becomes Internet-facing. But you use regular in-network security rather than hardened security for Internet. Well, guess what? Vulnerabilities that exist on a local server when placed out onto the internet, like on your DMZ, they're going to get compromised. At one point, I remember reading about a particular vulnerability in Microsoft servers that were compromised on average. If you just took one out there and laid it out on the internet, it was compromised on average within three minutes. Anywhere on the internet, if you did not harden it before you put it on the internet, people are out there actively scanning for vulnerabilities in servers and services because they know what to look for. Okay, so just be aware. you got to harden the stuff, get it scanned, get a security scan, a hard security scan on it before you put it out on the internet. Don't toss it out there, then start to patch it. Okay? Uh, next one, failure to detect or block phishing attempts. That's a big deal because it goes straight to your people's mailboxes. I, I read somewhere that something like 85 to 90 percent of internet email traffic is malware, spam, or phishing attempts. Nine out of ten emails that traverse the Internet shouldn't. So you need to make sure that your people are trained and aware of what to look for. 
and they don't just click stuff because it arrived in their inbox and says, hi, we're from IT. We want to help. Just be aware. And then the last one, poor endpoint detection and response. In other words, you do not have an intrusion detection system. You do not have an intrusion prevention system in place. Stuff happens to you and you don't know about it. Okay? Wow, that was one page. Let's keep going. Mitigations to help strengthen network defenses. Now, this is at least three, three pages long, so I'm going to try and get through this kind of quickly. Applying the following practices can help organizations strengthen their network defenses against common, exploited, weak security controls and practices. What do you think the first one is? Control access. You guys ever heard of zero trust? It's been all in the news. Zero trust means don't put stuff out there with default access. Only have access based on what you need. Okay, zero trust. You start off with zero access and then you put access in. Limit the ability of a local administrator account. Um, that means that, for example, the default administrator account is not there anymore. Uh, they're, they're what are called DISA STIGs for um, the DOD. Uh, administrator, local administrator accounts must be disabled and renamed. Now, you may be able to do something to allow certain permissions for certain other administrator accounts, but anything that arrived in that operating system has to be disabled and renamed so that even if somebody gets in and compromises your system, they can't immediately locate that local administrator account. It got renamed. It's something else now. Okay? So it, it blocks, it breaks the standard method of establishing um, access into your accounts, unauthorized access. So either disable or limit your administrator accounts. Control who has access to your data and services. Do you know what that's called? From your Security Plus studies. Control who has access. It's called least privilege. Least privilege. You can look it up. Next one, give employees access only to the resources needed to perform their tasks. If you are a um, help desk person, you may not need domain admin rights. That's called segregation of duties. Help desk people have help desk access. Server admins have server admin access. Help desk people do not have server admin access because they are not server admins. That's called segregation of duties or separation of duties. Okay? You always have to remember least privilege and segregation of duties. Have to. To be in cybersecurity. Next one, change default passwords. We just talked about that of equipment and systems upon installation or commissioning. You stand it up, change passwords. Okay? Ensure there are processes in place for the entry, exit, and internal movement of employees. If somebody moves from one position to another, their access should change. Don't allow, and it's called privilege creep. I started here, and then I go over to here, then I get promoted, and guess what? I still retain permissions from here and here, and yet I'm here now. Why is that? It's called privilege creep because you, you're too busy, you as the system administrator, and you don't have controls in place that say check to make sure these people have only the access they need. Okay, so entry, when somebody arrives, they're given certain permissions. When, they're move, when they move around, let's say they get promoted or a new job, their privileges change to match that new job. And also when somebody leaves. Uh, with our organization, there are two ways to leave. 
One is happy and one is sad, if you want to think about it. If somebody leaves happy, in other words, gave their two weeks notice, didn't have elevated privileges somewhere, etc., and they depart, you have to disable their account within a certain amount of time. I've been in positions where somebody leaves sad or angry or disgruntled or whatever. And you know what? You disable their account, then you go escort them to the door. Leave happy or leave sad. There are totally different uh, ways to deal with that for employee departure. Okay, next one, harden your condition, conditional access policies. Make sure that, again, only permissions are given that are required for certain things and only for the minimum amount of time needed. So let's say somebody requires, I don't know, 60 day um, access to your source library to do a, uh, let's say, security scans. Okay, after those 60 days, their access is removed. Conditional access policies, make sure that they are also in place. And the last one, verify that all machines, including cloud-based virtual machine instances, do not have open RDP ports. Harminder, what does RDP stand for? Your help desk, what, is, what does RDP stand for? You're muted. Okay, RDP, okay, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing remote and P for port and D for Rem remote desktop? No, I'm no. not. I know in my mind, yeah. but I know actually. I know. If you think about it, it's rem uh, I think it's called remote data protocol. Post protocol. Yeah. yeah, but RDP means, let's say I'm sitting here at my workstation and I want to get to a server somewhere. I just do an RDP session over to that server and now I'm logged into that server. So I'm sitting here nice and happy and now I'm also doing work over here nice and happy. But it ha um, many servers have RDP ports open just for convenience. But guess what? RDP is a well-known place where bad actors can get access to servers and systems. So make sure only RDP ports that need to be open are open. Otherwise, turn RDP services off. Okay? That's what that means. Thank you, Harminder. I knew okay, I'd catch thanks. it. But yeah, yeah remote thanks. access. Yes. Yeah, okay, more mitigations. You can do what's called implementing of credential hardening. And number one there, MFA. Multi-factor authentication. Number two, change or disable vendor supplied default usernames and passwords and enforce the use of strong passwords within your client base. And number three, set up monitoring to detect the use of compromised credentials on your systems. Okay? And third set of mitigations, antivirus and anti-malware. And make sure that the scan results are viewed routinely. Don't just do it, but look at what you've done. Because sometimes they'll pop up little alerts or warnings that all of a sudden you're like, well, wait, this particular system keeps trying to go out to the internet. Why is that? And it, it can cause you to start doing some research and find out where something is doing what's called signaling. Signaling. And that means that it has been compromised and it's trying to connect to mama bear out on the internet. Okay? So, oh, at page four, employee detection tools and search for vulnerabilities. Endpoint and detection response tools. That includes um, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, and what's called rogue system detection. Rogue systems, um, they're big in DOD, not so big in other organizations, but that's where one workstation literally monitors all the other workstations in its local network to say, wait a minute, this other system is acting weird. Okay, so your workstation could literally be monitoring the workstation next to you to say, uh, something's awry here, and it pops an alert. 
rogue detection. It's good to have, but it uses a lot of processor power and bandwidth. Okay, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention. Do you know the difference between IDS and IPS? Harminder. Yes. So intrusion detection, what they what they do, intrusion intrusion detection, it finds the find the vulnerability, find ki what's going on and giving the alerts ki what's going on the network and what happened in prevention system. So it prevents the unauthorized people. It prevents the unauthorized people or user to come in the network or come in the data. That's it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Um, if you think about it, intrusion detection basically says, hey, we have an intrusion. It doesn't stop anything. It just says, give hey, alerts to us. I give yeah, alerts to yeah, us. Yeah, it pops yes, an alert up. What's going on in the network? Yes. Yeah. Right. Intrusion prevention says, "Hey, I just blocked this." <laughs> uh, just so. like an antivirus, I block this thing and this thing. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, okay. Penetration testing. That that's the fancy word for bring in a team to do security scans against your own network. Uh, vulnerability scanning, again, the same thing. And cloud service provider tools to detect overshared cloud storage and monitor for abnormal accesses. People like Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Google, they have tools that will, uh, that you can use that will allow you to monitor, let's say if you have Amazon Web Services. Amazon will make tools available to you, but you have to use them. Okay. Mitigations, page five. Maintain rigorous configuration management programs. What that means is, let's say you have a server and you want to put it out on your DMZ. Make sure that your server is configured for DMZ use before you put it out there. Nothing goes out on internet available systems until it is hardened and scanned for those strengths. Don't put it out there and then strengthen it. What is DMZ? Oh, I'm sorry. DMZ, okay. Number one, there's the internet, wild, wild west. Number two, there is, you could call it your intranet or stuff that's behind your agency firewalls. Then there is an area that's called the DMZ, which your agency or organization manages, but is accessible in some way, shape, or form from the internet. The internet usually can't get to your workstation at your desk. Okay? It can only get to a certain depth within your network. That is what's called the DMZ, or, and it's from a military term, demilitarized zone, DMZ. Okay? And it basically means hardened, but still managed by us down here within our infrastructure. Okay? So like um, um, uh, AT&T.com, it's internet accessible, but AT&T still manages everything in that particular uh, domain. All right? All right. Oh, number six, software and patch management. Make sure that you have a patch management system so all the patches are applied and applied routinely. Best practices. Here's where I wanted us to get. Best practices to protect your systems. This is something that you should always think about and try and make sure is in place for you. Number one, control access to systems and services. Number two, harden your credentials. Okay? Make sure that everything is um, high encryption, large security keys, PKI enabled, multi-factor authentication, etc., etc. Harden your credentials. Establish centralized log management. That's where the auditors go through and say who accessed what and were they supposed to. Log management. Antivirus solutions, always good to have at the enterprise level. Detection tools, in, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, malware pro, uh, protection, etc. Detection tools. 
operate services exposed on internet accessible hosts, that's your DMZ, with secure configurations. Keep software updated. Okay, make sure that everything is patched when it's supposed to so that you're, you aren't uh, vulnerable. And again, here's the, here's the link, and uh, I will send it to everybody uh, in our chat. But I recommend that you go out and read this and make sure that you know everything that it says. Because you can bet your boots they will ask you stuff at your job interview about this. This is the absolute minimum that you must know in order to prove that you are a good cybersecurity professional. Okay? So I just sent it to everybody in, in the chat. All right. Are there any questions? We're, we're sort of out of time. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Harminder, go ahead. So I have a quick question about the cybersecurity tools. Because nowadays there are so many tools in cybersecurity and different companies using the different tools. Sure. So if I want to give an interview in a cybersecurity in any company as a cyber analyst, so they ask me what tools you know about a cybersecurity and do you have any hands-on experience on a tool? And they ask that kind of question. You know, different tools have a different tool they use in a different method they pop up the alerts and time some tools they give the description detail and some less so which so i'm just preparing myself for a cybersecurity analyst so right. which tool cybersecurity i have to be learned to get a foot door in the company or a job right um very good question and it's a it's a difficult one to answer because frequently the tools that um a organization like you know, bankofamerica.com employees are very expensive. And you can't get that tool, you know, without mortgaging your house um, and learn about it. So what I recommend you do is you learn on the smaller tools. You learn on these practices. You learn how to make sure, and this is a phrase that you need to know, good cyber hygiene okay cyber hygiene means that you know how to do this you just haven't been trained in the specific tools that allow you to do this um, and while you're learning it's always helpful to to go learn Linux be careful about what Linux you learn on because there is one Linux at least one that is sort of they say it's for cybersecurity professionals, but the same Linux can be used by the bad guys and is used by the bad guys that is used by the good guys. So if you say, hey, I've learned on Kali Linux, that doesn't give you much in the way of credibility. Um, so be careful of Kali Linux because it, it can be a two-edged sword. If somebody knows that they use John the Ripper, which was in Kali Linux, against their infrastructure and you say I know Kali Linux that may not be such a great thing to be saying in your interview you should say I've been studying Linux I know like Linux command prompts um, how to do things like secure a Linux server those sorts of things good just be careful about that Kali Linux it's a two-edged sword it's got lots of security tools good and bad okay Chris, so this is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, no, so this security tool, I have to be learn research online or on a YouTube how this work. Or if I, I know they have a very limited access. If I get a free version of, um, sometimes, but remember that Linux is free. Ubuntu Linux, for example, totally free, and they provide security updates to it. So you can start learning on Ubuntu. Chris, do you have any suggestions? I would say, unless specifically mentioned by the job announcement, just say Linux. Yep. 
a very smart approach. Yeah, Kali Linux sounds like, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a cyber practitioner. Yeah, well, you're not. <laughs> if you're just my resume. <laughs> yeah, if you are just if you are just um getting into it entry level and you're wandering around talking about Kali Linux, imagine a kid with a BB gun. And you're in a Windows store. <laughs> A glass store, you know, a kid with a BB gun. Uh, yeah, but do they know where to point it? <laughs> so just be aware, Kali Linux is a, you know, I wouldn't talk about Kali Linux, even if I knew Kali Linux. Yeah, one second, I like Chris's suggestion. Say Linux. Yep, I need to take it off. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, anything else before we finish up? Robert? Thank you so much. Just wanted to thank you so much. For yeah, my time. pleasure. Glad to have you. Harmander, always good to have you. And I'm glad yeah. you, you don't have to sit and whisper into the microphone. So oh, yes, I know. That means he's all by himself today. Uh, yes, I might sound so that, but I'm kind of good. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm yep. Okay, guys. Have okay, a great thank weekend. You and, uh, too, and we will talk thank later. You. Yep, thank, thank you very much and have a good